We are going to look at the organization chart. What entities do we need to consolidate? We are going to look at how to set up your financial statements, how to set up those entities so they add up and consolidate into one financial economic entity. Three, these are going to be some operational considerations when you have multiple companies interacting together. And then four, how to pull it all together and make sure it is actually correct. So let's dive into this. Let's go over consolidated financials. Before you start pulling numbers together, pulling financials together, the first thing you need to do is you need to review your legal organization chart. What legal entities are going to consolidate into the parent? Who is the parent? And what entities does that parent own or have a controlling financial interest in? That needs to be, that assessment needs to happen before you can even pull anything together. Then you need to consider, hey, do I only own a portion or control a portion of a subsidiary? Because if that's the case, you're gonna have this concept of non-controlling interest to consider as well. Non-controlling interest have a whole nother video. That was part three. So if you don't know what non-controlling interest is, once you get done with this video, go check that one out. So once you've made your assessment, you're gonna define, hey, this is the parent. Here are my subsidiaries. Here's our situations where I'm gonna have non-controlling interest. Your next step is building out the structure that allows you to roll up all those entities into one economic entity. So let's go over the setup. I'm gonna use Excel in this example. And we're going to have Parent Incorporated. We're gonna have 100 LLC, one of the subsidiaries. Sub LLC, another subsidiary. And then when we roll this all together, there's elimination entries that we need to take into consideration to get our consolidated financials. And when you're setting up your structure, you wanna know, hey, do I own 100%? Do I own 75%? Do I own 50%? What is the controlling financial interest that the parent has in the subsidiary? So in this example, 100 LLC, 100% owned by the parent, but then sub LLC is only 75% owned by the parent. So in that situation, we're going to have non-controlling interest when we pull the financials together. Next, let's go over the operational considerations when you are pulling consolidated financials together. So one thing is how do you account for each individual legal entity? Since Parent Incorporated has ownership in 100 LLC and sub LLC, on the Parent Incorporated's own books, their legal entity books, they are gonna have investments in those two subsidiaries. So if we look at the balance sheet here, you'll see there is an investment in sub LLC and there's an investment in 100 LLC. This is equity method accounting. So in Parent Incorporated's books, they are rolling up the earnings or the net income related to these two subsidiaries. Um, equity method accounting on the parent side, they are recognizing their pro rata portion of earnings from the investment. So 100 LLC, they're recognizing 100% of the income related to that entity. And sub LLC, they're recognizing 75% of the income. And you'll see this here on the income statement. Income statement is where the equity income that is the pro rata portion of earnings or net income related to ownership in the subsidiary. So you'll see equity income of 100 LLC go down to the net income of 100 LLC. You see it's 90, so since it was 100%, it's gonna recognize $90,000 of net income or equity income. And they are also recognizing 75% of the net income related to sub LLC because it has a 75% ownership. Now that is just for legal entity parent incorporated. We are going to eliminate all this activity when we roll up uh, the two subsidiaries into the parent for the consolidated financial statements. So journal entries related to equity income. So in this situation, we're just gonna recognize the subsidiary's income. I'm just gonna go through the entries. Equity income for the investment in the both subsidiaries, this is from Parent Incorporated's books. Since Parent Incorporated owns 100% of 100 LLC, they are going to recognize a $90,000 increase in the investment, that's the debit, and then the credit is $90,000 of equity income. Basically, their investment generated $90,000 of net income. And from a legal entity standpoint, they have a line item of equity income, 100 LLC, $90,000. And you'll see that on Parrot Incorporated's income statement, ignoring the consolidated effort and all the other entities. Exact same concept with sub LLC, except 
We don't own 100%. You're only going to recognize 75% of the net income. So I'm going to take the 330 times 75%. That gets me 247 500 That's going to be a debit to my investment in sub. And then a credit to sub LLC equity income. And you'll see that on the parent's uh, income statement as equity income from sub LLC, $247,500. So Parent Incorporated, just from their legal entity standpoint, is recognizing the net income of the ownership related to the subsidiaries that they have a controlling or a financial interest in. Another part with equity method accounting, let's say one of those entities declares a distribution, a dividend. In that situation with equity method accounting, that dividend or distribution is not revenue. It actually reduces um, it actually reduces your investment on the balance sheet. So let's say you get fifty thousand dollars from hundred LLC. That's going to be a debit to cash because you got the money, and then it's going to be a credit to the investment in hundred LLC that's sitting on the balance sheet, which will reduce your cost basis or your basis in that investment. Same thing with sub LLC. They sent you seventy-five thousand dollars. Let's say they declared a $100,000 distribution. You own 75%. You get $75,000. It's going to be a debit to operating cash and then a credit to investment in sub LLC. That's some basic equity method. I wanted to go over that because when you're recording your activity related to the subsidiaries, you need to keep, you need to keep in mind of what the parent's ownership is in that subsidiaries because from a legal entity standpoint, Parent Incorporated still needs to keep their books intact, even though they're eventually going to consolidate all these entities in this example. A lot of times, you a organization will define an entity that pays all the bills, pays all the payroll, and then they will allocate those expenses out to the other entities. That doesn't happen everywhere but at least in my experience there's always been a paymaster a primary entity that pays for everything which leads to this next subject which is intercompany accounting when you have entities that are transacting with each other it creates intercompany payables and receivables parent incorporated in our situation pays payroll for all the other subsidiaries but 100 llc actually has employees that should be allocated to that entity so Technically, those employees are on Parent Incorporated's payroll, but we are going to use this. We're going to go through the journal entries of how to allocate that payroll expense to 100 LLC from the payroll, leaving the operating account of Parent Incorporated. So let's just use a nice round number of $25,000. From Parent Incorporated's standpoint, they pay $25,000 of payroll expense related to an employee that's of 100 LLC. So from Parent Incorporated standpoint, they have paid payroll that will be allocated to 100 LLC. So from Parent Incorporated standpoint, their journal entry for $25,000 of payroll expense is to debit the intercompany receivable from 100 LLC and then credit operating cash. The cash went out the door to cover the payroll and now 100 LLC owes Parent Incorporated $25,000. Now, from 100 LLC's books, from their standpoint, they have $25,000 of payroll expense that's going to go in the income statement. And now they have an intercompany payable to Parent Incorporated, which is a due to, or they owe money to Parent Incorporated for the payroll that they paid. If you, so that's, that is Parent Incorporated being the paymaster in this situation and 100 LLC receiving an allocation from Parent Incorporated. So how does Parent Incorporated get paid back for that $25,000? So 100 LLC, let's say they have $25,000 in cash, they would then pay back Parent Incorporated. It's kind of the reverse uh, journal entries here. They are gonna send it, they're gonna send $25,000 to Parent Incorporated. They're gonna debit operating cash when the money hits Parent's cash account. And then they're gonna credit the intercompany receivable from 100 LLC. And then from 100 LLC's books, they are going to debit the intercompany payable to Parent Incorporated. They're paying back the $25,000 that was allocated to them, and they're going to credit cash for the transfer of money to Parent Incorporated. That is how intercompany activity can arise and how it can get be settled when you have multiple entities transacting together, and you have, especially if you have a paymaster in that situation. With intercompany relationships, there is some, there's some other considerations that you want to have. 
One says these are totally separate legal entities, even though they might have they might be owned 100%. There should be some sort of agreement between the two entities on how uh, the money gets paid back from a multiple reasons, from a legal, from a tax perspective. You want to have uh, these intercompany uh, agreements between the entities, especially if you have multinational or non-U.S. entities that you're consolidating. You really want to make sure you have your operating or your intercompany agreement with that entity outside the United States just because not only are you taking into consideration of U.S. tax law or laws in the United States, you also need to take into consideration the laws of the country that you're also operating in. Another uh, the last consideration before we just start pulling these financials together is these entities, if they generate profits and they're not paying back intercompany activity, they can dividend or distribute up those earnings to the parent. And in that situation, in that situation, we're going to follow the equity method accounting where you're going to debit distribution, credit cash for the legal entity or this for the subsidiary the journal entry is going to be debit distributions which is an equity and then credit cash for any dividends or distributions that have been paid to a parent the last part of this is going over the financial statements so when you're pulling the financial statements together there's a couple things you want to look for to ensure these things are clearing out eliminating or certain things are just carrying through from a consolidated standpoint. So one example of that is to make sure your intercompany activity, your receivables and payables all net out because from a consolidated standpoint, there is no intercompany activity or intercompany payables and receivables. You're one economic entity. So in our balance sheet here, I wanna make sure I net out all the intercompany payables and receivable between Parent Incorporated, Sub LLC, and 100 LLC. Another thing that you might want to set up if you do not currently have it set up is a intercompany report. Basically, you're going to set up the do twos and do froms and just make sure they net to zero and they equal each other. Normally, if your payable and receivable don't equal each other, you're not going to balance on your balance sheet. And if you don't eliminate every portion of the intercompany payable and receivable, your balance sheet also is not going to balance. Those are some checks to have in place to ensure that your intercompany activity when you roll up everything is getting properly eliminated. All right, next part we want to look at is to make sure all our elimination entries are in because from a consolidated point, you have no investments in subsidiaries. They are one economic entity. This does involve eliminating the equity section of your subsidiaries. Now, we do have non-controlling interest because we do not own 25% of sub LLC. So let's back out the portion of sub LLC we do not own. All right, that's our non controlling interest. So I've, I've put the elimination entries into our balance sheet. So in the income statement, we want to eliminate the equity income because. The full results of those two entities are now reflected in the total consolidated income statement. Also, since we only own 75% of sub LLC, I need to back out 25% of their net income, reflect the portion of sub LLC's net income that outside owners retain. Next, you want to make sure your retained earnings carries all the way through. And when I say that is basically parent incorporated effectively through equity income, if we're just looking at them as a standalone legal entity, has recognized the net income and the activity related to the subsidiaries through equity method accounting in the investments. So the retained earnings or in the net income in this situation should be identical to parent incorporated as a standalone legal entity. So that's a good check to determine that that has carried forward properly. Now, the one difference, the one caveat that we have with the consolidated financials is the non-controlling interest. The last one that should be very obvious, but it can get you because you've thought about a lot of other things up until this point, is to make sure the balance sheet balances. That is the, that is the most critical part of this to ensure everything is flowing through as it should and you haven't missed anything. If your balance sheet doesn't balance, it's a clear sign that you have something that is off. That is consolidating accounting, taking your organization's chart, your legal entities, and then layering all the pieces to ultimately get consolidated financials. 
Hope this was helpful. I'll see you in the next video. Take care and goodbye.